Daryl Lennington here from ITNewsAfrica.com and I'm here with Tatiana Jambazova who's the Senior Product Manager for Emerging Technologies at Autodesk. So what we've actually found out at this event is that some of the museums in Kenya have been 3D printing some of the artifacts in order to preserve their lifespan. So could you tell me a little bit more about this? Thank you, Daryl. So, um it's an unbelievably exciting world that we live in. It's a world in which technology just bursts around us and there's so many new opportunities for professionals to push their professions to the limits using some of this tech. When it comes to museum, museums, they have uh, realized recently that by using um, scanning technologies, uh, capturing the real world and digitizing it and then using new fabrication methods like 3D printing or any computer numerically controlled machines and then using a third trend which is the world of uh, WebGL and being able to explore in 3D online in web browser or through goggles through VR and AR that combination of those three trends has taught museums that there is an, there is an opportunity to start digitizing the collections so that they can be then reprinted back in the real world in different materials in different sizes and shapes for the purpose of um, research scientific research or for the purpose of education as well as put in browser on a website that now does not look like a boring website where you have a photo, you have a text, you read two minutes, you're bored. Here you have a website of, in this case, the Turkana Basin Institute, where Dr. Louise Leakey and her students are working on digitizing the artifacts from the Museum in, of Nairobi. And um, they're putting all the digitized artifacts on the website with the idea that any teacher, when they teach, about our ancestry or any uh, scientist who is interested in um, measuring, comparing, learning about uh, the fossils, uh, as well as any parent who wants to teach their kids about um, in a new interactive way can use that site. So it's really this um, confluence of three technology trends, uh, ubiquitous sensors that help us digitize the analog world and bring it in a computer, make a 3D model. then the new fabrication methods that take that 3D model and can reprint it in the real life or take the 3D model and with the um, web uh, GL or VR AR technologies experience them interactively in a digital environment. So the real becomes physical, uh, becomes digital and then becomes physical again and then it can become digital again. So it's this line between what is physical and what is digital today is blurring and it brings lots of opportunities for better education, for better spreading of knowledge about our cultural, our natural past, um, for creating 3D digital replicas for archival purposes, for future generations, because there is no future if we don't take care of the past, if we don't learn from past mistakes, from past achievements. And I think this is the age where uh, museums start to realize that their mission to spread knowledge can be augmented, can scale to the whole world because the moment something is digital and it can be put on a website, it can be accessed by everybody. Okay, so as these artifacts have been replicated via 3D printing, uh, how accurate are they? So the accuracy of the prints depends on the accuracy of the capture. There are multiple different methods of capture. Some are slower, some are faster, some are more precise, some look more beautiful in color and texture. So in the case of um, AfricanFossils.org, for example, the project um, in Kenya, um, they are using multiple methods. They started with photogrammetry because it was inexpensive or let's say free, because photography doesn't cost anything today, right? Um, but for the purposes of accuracy or sometimes when shapes are too complicated, now they do combination between structured light scanners and they use Artec 3D scanners that are uh, very easy to use uh, and um, are doing a little bit more accurate capture than photogrammetry, but then they use the photogrammetric capture to apply the texture on the model so that it looks pretty and not as just precise. So, but basically, uh, the 3D printer will be precise printing as long as your model is precise. Okay. Only low-cost 3D printers might be a little bit bubbly, you know, yeah. but um, when we talk about any decent printer today, 
um, the artifact will look just as um, good as the captures. And here is, I'm holding one of the skulls of some of our grand, 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 mother or father. Um, and this was directly printed without any machining, without any mold or cast uh, from the digital file that was generated automatically from the photos. Okay, so where where is this technology being used elsewhere apart from Kenya? Is it being used in any other African countries or any other parts of the world? So if we're talking about museums, um, one of the first uh, large museums that really got uh, into the whole concept of future, the museum of the future is the Smithsonian. Uh, they're the largest collection of museums in the world. They have 154 million objects, but only 1% is in the museum because they simply don't have enough space. So they were thinking uh, of methods how to uh, show off all their collections on one hand. On the other hand, how to actually give access to their collection to the whole world, to, to, to people who will never make it in DC, who will never make it in New York, etc. So they were very early on, uh, five, six years ago at least, started to explore the different digitization methods. They, they even started using micro CT scanners and CAT scans and uh, laser LiDAR scanners and structured light photogrammetry, just anything to learn, to learn which method is applicable to which types of objects best. And today they're experts in that. We help them on the way. We collaborated also to create an online tool uh, that is now called the Smithsonian Explorer. Uh, that is really this prototype of how a museum in the future can look like. In that online tool, the objects look as beautiful as in real life and not, I joke, as in second life. Mm -hmm. um, they can be interactively explored in a multimedia environment that either a curator has prepared for you and uh, you can follow a tour, but you can stop it at any time because it's not a video, it's a 3D model, or you can explore on your own. And this tool enables beautiful visual, visual quality, scientific um, types of visualizations, um, then you can, um, the curators can add uh, hot spots and hot zones, mark stuff, add audio, add video, add any type of historic drawings, anything, the, the terrain, wherever it was made, etc. So these new WebGL-based exploratory tools enable then the whole world to go and is it a parent who is teaching the kids, is it a teacher at school, is it another scientist, can really um, have access to this knowledge in the most effective way without having the actual artifact. But they can download the 3D model from the website and print it for themselves. So a scientist in China or in the UK or in America can collaborate with Louise uh, and her team can 3D print some of the artifacts. What's also interesting is that um, uh, Dr. Louise Leakey and her mom, even today when they have new findings, when they write new papers, now they start to add to the paper a 3D printed artifact of the bone, of the part of the fossil that they're talking about. It really makes for a better scientific research as well because you don't want necessarily to hold the, the original skulls, they yeah. will disintegrate in your hands. It's not um, serious business, right? And uh, the idea is that um, you can also be able to measure, com compare, um, com um, um, uh, and um, research further without um, hurting the originals. All right. And then how long does it take for a museum to replicate the artifacts within it? Scaling this process is uh, still not a solved issue today. Um, almost everything is kind of manual. Uh, smaller museums are doing photogrammetry just by taking literally pictures all around. Others have started to build automated rigs. So you have a setup with 30, 40 cameras and then you put the object inside and they snapshot at the same time and then once you have the 200, 300, 400 photos, you just upload them in our software. The software is then very fast. Uh, it uses cloud computing and it can be from two hours to seven hours, but you don't do anything. It's just running in the cloud and when it's ready, you receive an email that it is done. And when it's done, that means you got a 3D digital model, a real replica of the original just in a virtual environment. And now that you have that, 
you can then send it to printer, you can send it to a laser cutter, you can send it to a computer numeric controlled router, late machine, whatever, to create copies in plastic, in wood, in whatever material you want. Or you can take that 3D digital model and you can use it on websites for education, you can use it on VRAR to explore, and also, you know, you can use it in game, in film, in whatever is useful. Dr. Louise Leakey also um, is using kites and drones to capture the terrain where they're excavating okay. and to map uh, where did they find which parts, which if you can imagine now, if everybody would do that, mm -hmm. then and every museum in the world is online, we can start to find with machine learning patterns across our heritage items yeah. that maybe we as human beings could have never done. So it essentially make finding these artifacts a lot easier, right? Yes, and also finding the connection between the artifacts. I always also joke that you might have a Ming vase in China, uh, from China uh, that is today in Louvre, but maybe the handle is in British Museum. Mm. And I don't think the British Museum or Louvre will give the other guide the, the other half or part, but now we can do virtual assembly, right? But imagine collections, imagine um, digitizing species, and all of a sudden we digitize all the turtles from China to America, and they're on one platform, and machine learning system can find, oh, these are similar to this, and these were growing here, here, and this. So we will, we will be able to connect dots differently. You were mentioning in your presentation earlier that uh, what you've done is you've 3D printed turtle shells in order to preserve the life of various different species of turtles. So how, how does that exactly work? So this, these are lovely stories. Um, it started in the Mojave Desert. Um, in America there is um, a turtle that is in the last generation before extinction, uh, mainly because of um, uh, population explosion of ravens that are now 700 times more in quantity than in 1960s. Why? Because of us building cities, piling up garbage, they have abundance of life and they're just growing and, and being everywhere. Now we created this disbalance in nature as human beings, so we humans have to fix it. So um, turtle scientist and uh, technology entrepreneur, Dr. Bill Borman and uh, Tim Schultz, decided to use this technology uh, to lure the ravens that are attacking the babies, um, to record the predatory act, and then to find ways to rewire their behavior so they stop attacking the turtles. And um, what they decided to do is to digitize tortoise shells, and we helped them on the way because this was all new for them. Uh, we created 3D digital models, then we 3D printed them, and they look uncannily the same as original tor tor tortoise, um, printed in color, and then they placed them in the desert. They first wanted to see will they fool the ravens, because they're apparently the most intelligent bird on the planet, right? Well, they definitely fooled them. The ravens came and they were stubbornly trying for 10 minutes to eat a meat from a 3D printed turtle. So that failed, <laughs> but the, the experiment succeeded. And because they knew where they placed the lures, um, they had webcams to record the predatory acts. And finally, how did they rewire the behavior? This is a work in progress, but the idea is to put something like a pepper spray for people, but this will be a pepper spray based on orange or grapefruit juice concentrate or something uh, on a pressure sensor or inside the turtle, so that when raven attacks, it sprays or it emits uh, a smell that the, the raven doesn't like, and after a couple of times we expect being intelligent, the raven will say, I'm out of here, man, this is not for me. So that would be one way to do that. What's beautiful with this story is that those turtle scientists, thanks to the web, thanks to the connectivity, uh, got contacted by a South African scientists who are having the same issue with the geometric tortoise. That is one of the rarest tor uh, um, tortoise in, in the world and yeah. um, it's on a brink of extinction. Um, the reasons are very similar. It's crows and ravens and others um, subsidized um, wildlife, you know, monguses and foxes. There are other issues as well, like fires, wildfires, 
um, due to global warming or some non-native species like acacia brought from Australia, but mainly um, it's the predators. So they got in touch and said, hey, we have the same problem. We would love to learn from you. And then they contacted me and um, uh, my colleague and I helped them create a 3D digital model of the geometric tortoise. And actually on this trip, I brought 50 of those fake tortoises with me with the idea to share them with the scientists. And they start seeing if, if they can fool the South African wildlife and teach them not to attack the tortoises. But as you can see, we're talking all the time about the same technology and it has so much different usage, mm -hmm. be it museums being digitized, science being approached to, in a different way, um, doing field research or even rewiring behavior of animals. We can talk about artist sculptors who like working with their hands and doing clay models, clay sculptures, and then digitize them to bring them to computer to, to continue developing. We can talk about industrial designers who like making physical prototypes when they design an object and then want to digitize it, bring it in a CAD software. And then on a larger scale, with the same technologies of capture, we can capture terrains and plan our buildings, plan excavation or construction site during construction, etc. So uh, for me, the fascinating thing is that we are a tool maker, but just like a knife, with a knife, you can carve a statue, you can uh, cut a meal, uh, cook a meal, you can kill a person. It's just technology, it's just a tool. It is you, the users around us, who make the best out of it. And um, the creativity of the user makes these tools uh, walk the talk. Perfect. So there we have it. History has met the future with 3D printing. Thank you very much for your time, Tatiana. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>